chapter 2 today. Um, Romans, of course, the theme of Romans is the righteousness of God and the unrighteousness of men. Uh, God's man is righteousness and we are unrighteous, we are sinners. Uh, the first step in anybody's coming to know the Lord as their Savior is to realize that they are sinners. And so Paul's first objective here is to help people to understand that they are sinners. And in chapter 1, we saw that the Gentiles are sinners, uh, have violated God's word and turned against him, and, they, and we saw the downward progression of uh, sin. And then last week, we saw that God was uh, God judges rightly or without partiality. And today we're going to look at Romans chapter 2, verse 17 through 29. Uh, not a long section, but filled with many things, and so um, let's look at that. Uh, this look, week we're going to look at the hypocrisy of self-righteous Jews. The hypocrisy of the self-righteous Jews. Um, first of all, we're going to look at their claims in verse 20, uh, 17 through 20. Uh, this is what it says. Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God, and knowest his will, and approvest all the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law. And art confident that thou thyself are a guide to the blind, a light to them that are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, uh, which hast the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. So there are several things that Paul is accusing the Jews of uh, hypocrisy in. First of all, he says, you call yourself a Jew. Thou art called a Jew. Okay, what does that mean? Well, they are Jews. The Jews are Jews, but that's not what that means. That means they, they thought that they were better than everybody else. Uh, they, they were above, and they looked down upon the Gentiles, the filthy Gentiles. Uh, what the Jews used to call the, do you remember what the Jews used to call the Gentiles? They called them dogs, you know. Dog, you know, nowadays we say, oh, they're cute little dogs. <laughs> Back then, they weren't cute little dogs. They would, you know, go out and uh, they're dirty and wild and things like that. And so they call them dogs, undesirable, you know, dogs. And so the Jews thought that they were better. Uh, they looked down upon, you know, those wicked sinners down there. It reminds me of the, the uh, typical Jew, like the Pharisee in Luke chapter 18. Remember him? Uh, and uh, it says... Uh, let's talk about Jesus, and he also told his parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. That's what Jews did, and this is the Pharisee. Two men went up to the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. And the Pharisee stood and prayed this, these things to himself, God, I thank thee that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, I pay tithes with all that I have, and I got, yet, and he went on and on about, I'm so good, God, this filthy ugh, tax collector over here, ugh, you know, and they looked down upon people, and so to call themselves a Jew was to say that they thought themselves special. Now, they were God's chosen people, as far as a nation was concerned, uh, but most a lot of Jews acted superior, uh, not like someone who understood that they were a sinner. And they were just a fellow sinner, like everybody else. They thought they were better. They thought they didn't, they weren't like those sinners. You know, they might need salvation, but oh, I'm good, you know. And so, Paul pointed out, first of all, the hypocrisy of calling yourself a Jew. And he says, and reliest on the law. Okay. In verse, uh, I don't know why this didn't come out. So, I highlighted all these verses, and then I must have done hit some button and deleted all the highlights. But uh, see, verse 17: "Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law." Okay, uh, they they uh, trusted in the law; they had the law. Okay, uh, but they had the presence, but not the practice of truth. Okay, they had the Bible, and they carried it in their hand the scroll, whatever. They had the, the written word of God. They had access to the written word of God, but it wasn't in their heart. It wasn't in their life. It wasn't something they put into practice. 
But they bragged that they, and you'll, you'll see the next one, they bragged and they boasted that we have God's law. You filthy Gentiles down there, you don't have God's law. We have God's law. You don't know nothing. We have, you know, they were uh, hypocritical in that way. Having the truth, they didn't display the attitude that the truth should have uh, had them to display. And then it says, he said, you boast in God. Uh, verse 17, and make us thy boast of God. They boasted that they know the true and living God. Your idols are wicked and you heathen. You don't know nothing about God. We know God. Well, they knew God because God had revealed himself in a special way to them, but they didn't understand who he was. Even though they had, you know, the, they had the scriptures, uh, it didn't help them to truly acknowledge who God was and therefore change their life. If they really knew who God was, if they really saw themselves as God sees them, as sinners, if they really saw God for who he is, holy, in light of our sinfulness, they would have had a different attitude toward God. But they boasted in God saying, we have the true God. Well, they did have the true God, but they didn't know who he was. Uh, they didn't uh, submit to him, as we'll see in a little bit. So they knew in theory, in th they, uh, their knowledge was uh, theoretical and not personal. They knew it in theoretical. They knew about God. And many people... Uh, there are many people who call themselves theologians. You know, they study the Bible, but they study it as a religious book of, uh, with like a lot of other religions. And so they know about the Bible, and they know the God of the Bible, and they could tell you what the Bible says about the God of the Bible, and they could tell you what the Bible says, but they, it's not a personal knowledge. It's not something that they've accepted as personally true and applied to their life. So they had the, the Jews in the same way. They had a theoretical they knew God in a theoretical way. You know, they knew who God was, but they didn't know him personally. They didn't have a personal relationship with him. Uh, they didn't have a communication a, uh, with him um, in you know, reading his word and praying to him. Uh, but they, they thought they had the true God, and so they boasted, we know the true and living God. But it didn't affect their lives at all. They didn't really know him in a personal way. They knew him in a, theolog a theological and a theoretical way. And then he goes on and says, uh, and they said, you know, we, you know, Paul said, and you know his will. Verse 18, and knowest his will. That's what they claim. This is the thing they claim, remember? They're saying, we this and we that and we that. We know his will. You know, we understand what God wants us to do. Uh, well, they didn't do it, <laughs> as we'll see a little bit later. They might have known what the Bible says in certain situations, but they didn't apply it. They didn't understand it and apply it to their lives. So they knew it. Uh, they, had a, they had a conceptual or um, non-experience. They, they knew him by, uh, they knew his will by concept, not by experientially. They didn't know his will because they were doing his will. They knew his will because the Bible says, you know, that God is this kind of person, this, this, this is what he, like, he wants and things like that. But they didn't have an experiential uh, knowledge of God's will. And then, whoops, and then it says, you, he said, you understand the important things. That's what they claim. We understand the important things. Verse 18 goes on. And approves the things which are more excellent. You know, the, what's, what's the priority? What's the important things? They, they claim to understand the important things. But again, their life did not reflect that. Presume that they had the right values just because God's word had the right values. It wasn't their personal values, though, in many cases. Okay. And then it says, have been instructed from the law. That's what they said. Verse 18, being instructed out of the law. They had God's word, they had the law, but they didn't keep the law. Okay. They didn't do what God's law said. You know, they did some of the Traditional the the um, ceremonies and things like that that God's law prescribed, but they didn't they obeyed you know the letter of the law sometimes without the spirit of the law. They didn't understand why God said to do what He did. They were just doing the actions without thought, without understanding. Uh, they, they could say we do what God's word says because they would do the sacrifices and things like that, and but they didn't understand what the meaning were to them life personally. Uh, 
but they presume they have the right interpretation of God's law. You can have God's law, but if you don't understand what, how to apply it and what it means, uh, it doesn't do you any good. So they said, we have been instructed from God's law. And then uh, you consider yourself. They were, it says right there, it says, um, verse 19, and are confident that thou thyself art. And then it gives four things that they thought they were. Okay, so they were had self-confidence. They said, oh, I'm this, and I'm that, and I'm the other, and they were none of those things. Okay. But they said, first of all, it says, uh, they, they thought they were a, blind, a guide to the blind. Uh, verse 19, thou art confident that thy thyself are a guide of the blind. They said, we understand. And now it's talking about not physical blindness, talking about spiritual blindness, of course. Uh, let me teach you. You know, you are so blind, you don't understand anything. Let me help you. But So they thought they were a guide to the blind when they were the ones that were blind. Uh, the, the blind leading the blind when they were trying to be somebody. That's <laughs> what so Jesus said, blind leading the blind. But they thought they were a guide to the blind. And they thought they were a light for those in darkness. Verse 19. Guide the blind and light of them which are in darkness. The same, you know, it says the four things in different ways, but they said, we're a guide that we'll show you. And, and we're, we'll, you know, it's dark, nobody understands, and we're going to shine light upon it for you. And help you to understand it, like we do. <laughs> but they didn't even understand. Okay? But they thought, they had confidence that they were, understood the truth, and they could tell you the truth when they, when they couldn't. All the ones to show that, but uh, and then he says, uh, a corrector of the foolish. Uh, verse 20, an instructor of the foolish. Okay? We are so foolish, we don't understand. Let me correct you and tell you what's right. Uh, and they should have been these things, but uh, they, because of their, their non, not understanding that they were sinners. They thought that they were not sinners. And this is Paul's whole point, to tell them, you are. So you're, you're a bigger sinner. And we'll look at this in a little bit. You're the biggest sinner. They thought they were good, and the, the, he, the uh, Gentiles were bad. So we're up here, and you're down there. Let us help you. <laughs> and Paul reversed it. He goes, no, no, no. You're down there, and they're up there, <laughs> you know. They were actually the opposite, but they thought they were all these things. Then they thought that they were a teacher of the immature. Verse 19 goes on to say, I'm going to verse 20, an instructor of the foolish and a teacher of babes. People who don't understand me, let me teach you. You poor thing. Have you ever heard have heard anybody that talks down to people? Oh, they, lift, they kind of roll their eyes. Oh, you stupid person. Oh, okay, let me help you know. It's kind of the attitude that I uh, kind of read, read this. A uh, teacher of babes. Okay. So they were. They thought they were all these things. And uh, then he says, uh, you have the knowledge and truth that are concretely revealed in the law. And uh, verse uh, 20 goes on to say, teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and of the truth of, in the law. Okay. So they had the law, so they thought that they understood the truth because they had the law. It's just like, you know, you or me, sometimes we have the Bible, we have, you have God's word in your hand. That word of God reveals truth. It reveals temporal truth, it reveals eternal truth. It's true. But if you don't open it, you don't read it, it doesn't do you any good. You might as well not have it. You might as well throw it away. Okay? But they thought because they had it, we have that truth. But you don't know what it is, you don't read it, you don't study it, you don't share it, you know, try to apply it to your lives or anything. But they thought just having that was enough. Okay. And so they, they thought all these things. Uh, they they, uh, they called, they, they relied, they boasted, they knew, they understood, they were instructed, they considered, they're a guide, they're a light, they're a corrector, they're a teacher, and they had the knowledge. Okay. They thought all those things about themselves. But Paul said, you're hypocrites. You claim, what's a hypocrite? The easiest definition I uh, know of a hypocrite, we taught our children when they were young, is somebody that says one thing and does another. Okay? It's a hypocrite. When you say one thing, you do another, the opposite, you know. Uh, 
um, then you're a hypocrite. Um, we had a, there's a song that um, our kids used to listen to when they were young, you know, hypocrite. <laughs> it turned into a little funny song, but, you know, talking about hypocrites. Hypocrite is one who says something but does the opposite. And they were hypocrites. They said one thing and did the other. So Paul told, shows them they are hypocrites in verse 21 through 24. says, Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest, a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that sayest, a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law, Dishonorest thou God, and for the name of God is for the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. Okay, so there's several things uh, they taught but did not learn. Okay, it says, "Thou therefore teachest another, teachest not thou thyself." You know, you, you teach, but you don't learn. You say this is what you know is the truth, but you don't apply that truth to yourself. You don't teach yourself. So he says, you're a hypocrite. You teach, but you don't teach yourself. You teach others, but you don't need to understand. And then he said, number two, you preach, but you don't do. You don't do what you preach. He said, thou that preachest a man should not steal. Does thou steal? You know, the Bible says you're not supposed to steal. And then you go and steal or don't give God his due and steal his money that God gave you to do something with, use it upon yourself, and so you steal. So you, you that say, you shouldn't steal, do you steal? And then he says, though they say, but they do not listen, uh, thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? You say that this is wrong, but then you do what you say is wrong. Uh, you don't do what you say is right. So, uh, you know, Jesus himself said of uh, this issue of committing adultery, he says, uh, you know, they said, oh, we're not, we didn't commit adultery. But he said, Jesus said, I say unto you, he that looketh upon a woman to lust after in his heart hath committed adultery out of within her heart. So they said, oh, we never committed adultery. Have you ever looked at a woman with lust? Oh, yeah. Well, then you've committed adultery, you know. But you try to justify it because I haven't actually done, you know, um, and so they say, but they didn't listen to what they were saying. And now that sayest, and they abhorred, but they committed. They said they abhorred. Again, it says, in verse uh, 22, the middle part says, Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? You, you say, whoa, we, idol, we hate idols. And then they worship the idols of their heart. You know, They value something more than God. That's what worship is. If you... If you have an idol, that's what an idol is, I'm sorry. Uh, an idol is when you value something more than you value God, you, you, made, that, you made that thing an idol. So, uh, And you may say, oh, you know, God's the most valuable, but you never spend any time. You spend more time with this thing. You spend more effort, more money, more focus on this thing instead of God. Then you're making that an idol. Okay? That you can sit there, oh, you know, I hate idols. And then you make an idol yourself. So they, they said that they hated idols, but they made idols themselves and worship idols themselves. And then they boast, but they break. Verse 23, uh, Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law, dishonest thou God. Okay? So they say, we are people of the law. And then they would break the law. <laughs> they would violate the law of the word of God. Uh, they would lie and steal and things like that. And the Bible says, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet thy neighbors, whatever, and they would covet the neighbors and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but they would uphold the law. You know, we believe in the law. They, weren't, they were breaking the law. Uh, they were boasting of the law. Okay. So, Paul said, you are a hypocrite. Okay. And what is the result of their hypocrisy? First of all, they dishonored God. Did you catch that in verse uh, 23? Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God. They dishonor God. And they are hypocritical about God's law. They are bringing dishonor. They would claim to honor God. You know, but they were dishonoring God. 
in the way that they were saying but not doing. They were dishonoring God. Um, they, you know, they would have been better off not saying if they were not going to do. <laughs> you know, uh, the worst thing I've uh, heard of preachers who you know get up and preach against adultery, and then they go and commit adultery, and that throws a shadow on everything they said. Oh, they're doing that. What else did they lie about? You know. They're hypocrites. Or maybe, you know, maybe what they preached was the truth. Okay? But if you are not going to live in a way that you preach, if you preach one thing and you do another, that's actually worse than if you didn't say anything. You know, people get up and say, you know, preachers who preach against adultery and commit adultery are worse than preachers who don't preach against adultery and then they might commit adultery, but at least they can get up and say, you know, don't do this, and they did it themselves. And so they dishonor God. They might claim to be bringing honor to God, but they're dishonoring God by their with their words. But they're dishonoring God by their action, which voids their words, makes their words useless. It actually harms the cause of Christ. Um, if you're going to live in sin, don't preach. Okay. If you're going to live in sin, don't tell anybody you're a Christian. Okay. If you go sin, then don't tell anybody you're a Christian because you. You know, you say, oh, I'm a Christian, and then you go sin, you're, you're, that's worse. I, I remember that it brings up the, uh, that uh, there was a young lady who was possessed by a, a demon, and she went around, and she followed Paul around, and the demon in her said, these are the men of God, listen to them, the demon saying that, you know. And so Paul rebuked the demon and said, be quiet, because if a demon is going to attest to your godliness, you don't want the, the testimony of a demon, okay. It'd be better if he didn't say anything to say, all oh, these are, you know, it was true. He said what the demon said is true. But the demon saying that, people are going to say, well, the demon saying that, there must be, that must be wrong. So it was the opposite effect. Okay? So if I stand up and preach, and then I do exactly what I said not to preach, I did, said not to do it in my, my preaching, and I should, if I wouldn't have preached, it would have been better. Okay? And I think that's why the Word of God says that uh, be not many teachers because they'll suffer the greater condemnation. Okay? So, Anyway, so they dishonor God. Um, in John 8, 9, 49, Jesus answered, uh, I have not a devil, I honor my Father, but ye do dishonor me. And so they dishonor God. Now, and then secondly, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. That's what the verse 24 says. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you. So your actions give people an excuse to say, oh, yeah, that Christianity, that, I told you it was a bunch of junk. <laughs> so a preacher goes and commits adultery, and then people say, I told you, that's a, I, you can't listen to anything they say. It's all false. It's just all false. See, he went and committed adultery. He said he, he preached against it. And they give opportunity to God's enemies to blaspheme because they didn't practice what they preached didn't learn what they were teaching. Okay? It's the name of God was blasphemed. Uh, we're not going to read this, but if you want to look at a parallel, uh, this in Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 18 through 24, uh, gives uh, an account of that in the Old Testament. Okay? So, they were worse than the heathen. If you could, and Paul compares them. He says, you know, you say the heathen are down here and you're up here. But you know what? Uh, you're worse than them because, and he goes on, he'll, he'll explain it in verse 25 to 27. He said for, uh, verse 25 to 27 says, For circumcision verily profiteth if thou keep the law, but if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore, if the uncircumcision, those who don't have, aren't circumcised, keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counter for circumcision? And shall not un uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee, who by the letter and circumcision doth transgress the law. So what he is saying is a couple of things. First of all, he's saying um, those who are not circumcised are counted when they obey God's law. So the Gentiles did not have God's law, written law. They had God's law in their heart. 
and the Jews had God's law. But when the Jews who had God's law didn't do what God's law says, and the Gentiles who didn't have God's law in their hands, but they had God's law in their heart, and they did what God's law said, even though they didn't have the book, which one's better? The one who didn't have God's law and did what God's law, what the precepts of God's law, is better than the one who had God's law but didn't obey it. Okay? And so he is saying the uncircumcision is kind of a certainty. That they are like you're supposed to be. Okay? They don't have God's law in their hands, but they have it in their heart and they're obeying God's law in their heart. You have God's law in your hands, but you're disobeying God's law. And he says, so they're better. They condemn you. And that's the second point, is that uh, the uncircumcision will judge you. So he says, uh, and the uncircumcision, which by nature, if they fulfill the law, judge thee. Okay? They'll condemn you. Because they didn't have the written word of God, but they observed what God's revelation to them was. You had the written word of God, but you didn't do what God's word tells you to do. And so their actions condemn your actions. They act better than you do. Okay? So you're not only a sinner, you're a worse sinner than those Gentiles who you condemn. You see Paul's point now? Paul's telling him, you're a sinner. You need salvation. You're actually worse than the Gentiles who you condemn. And that's his whole point in the passage. is that They thought that they were right with God. They thought they were righteous. They thought these Gentiles are wicked sinners. And Paul said, no. You have the word of God. They don't have the written word of God. But they're obeying what God's revealed to them. And you're disobeying what God has revealed to you. And so they're better than you are. And not only were they sinners, they were sinners worse than the Gentile sinners, who they considered to be wicked sinners. Okay? So what is the solution Verse 28 and 29. For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. Neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart in spirit, and not in letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. Okay. So what is the solution? have a circumcised heart. The Jews were physically circumcised, and they thought that made them God's special people. Now, uh, God gave them the sign of circumcision to set them apart because they were God's people. Okay? God chose them, they responded and obeyed God, and they were God's people, and God gave them this external sign to be a testimony and a witness that they were God's peculiar people. But the sign in itself, in and of itself, without the faith behind the sign, was meaningless. Okay? And they had come to the point where they were physically circumcised, but they had no, no circumcised heart. They didn't, they didn't trust God in their heart. They would do the outward performance of certain things and think that that outward performance of those things is what saved them. It didn't outward performance was supposed to reveal what was in your heart. But if your heart if your heart didn't wasn't affected by the truth, your outward performance of that is meaningless. Okay? And that's what Paul's point is. And so they uh, they first of all needed to have their heart circumcised. Uh, not their body. They need to have their heart circumcised. So that's why it said uh, he is not a Jew. And they're talking about spiritually. Okay? The Jew is not one that is circumcised outwardly. The true Jew, the, those people who are separated unto God, who are God's people, are those people who had their heart circumcised, not their body circumcised. But that was the original sign, and God gave them that sign to, re, to reveal to everybody that they were God's particular people. But when they stopped obeying God, that sign became meaningless. Okay? And so he says, you know, not the outward sign is not what makes you holy. It's the inward sign of the heart that makes you uh, holy. And so the solution number one is to circumcise your heart instead of just your body. Circumcise your heart. And then secondly, uh, experience God's praise. Okay. Can you imagine this? It says, um, uh, search me the heart and the spirit, 
not in letter, whose praise is not of man, but of God. Now, the Jews, as I read the, of, of the Pharisee, what did they, what was their, what was the Pharisees' uh, greatest joy? It's for people to acknowledge him. <gasps> oh, look at that godly man. So when they prayed, they would like stand there and lift their eyes to heaven. Oh, God! And they would say, oh, look at that holy man, <laughs> you know? And they would, they would do things in their clothes and all sorts of things. And when they fasted, you know, they they didn't, um, you know, wash their face and appear normal and just fast before God. They would, like, suck in their teeth. Oh, I'm fasting. Oh. <laughs> People, oh, look at that holy man. He's fasting. Oh. You know, that's why they did it. So they could be seen of men, you know. So the people, oh, oh, look at that holy man. So that's the purpose they did it for. They did it to be seen of man. Not realizing, or, or maybe not even caring that God is the one that there should be seeking approval, not man. Who cares what man thinks? What God thinks is important. You should be concerned with what God thinks, what God, how God sees you, not what how men see you. But they did. They 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 thought about what men thought about them, not what God thought about them. And so, uh, whose praise is not a man but of God. So, our desire should be that God would praise us. How do, we, how do we know we are affirmed by God? We know that we are affirmed by God, first of all, and now, in the affirmation of God's word. What do I mean by that? God's word tells us what we should do, and so if we do what God's word tells us to do, that affirms us. Okay? That, that's pleasing to the Lord. We can, if you, you say, I wonder if what I'm doing pleases the Lord, how would you know? What does the Bible say? Okay, Not like, you know, do I have to guess? Uh, I don't know if God wants me to do that. If you want to know if God wants you to do it, and if God's pleased, and God says, yes, good, then look at his word. His word will affirm your actions. And so if you're doing what God's word says to do, his word affirms you. His word is your word of affirmation. And so when the Bible says, oops, sorry, wrong way. Be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. God says, be forgiving. Be kind and tenderhearted and forgiving. Okay? As I forgave you for Christ's sake, you be forgiving him. And so when you're forgiving, does God approve that? Yes, his word says right here, be kind one to another. And so if you're kind and you're tenderhearted, you're forgiving, God approves of you. Okay? God approves of that action because God's word says so. So God's word approves our action. We can read God's word and we can say, God wants me to do this. And when we do it, we can say, God's word approves my action because it says be kind and I'm being kind. And so I'm, God is approving of my action. Okay. So now God's word approves our action. But then, in affirmation of God's words, <laughs> but word and words, okay, God himself will with his own mouth, his words approve of us. In Matthew chapter 25, verse 21 says, And the Lord said unto him, This is an illustration that God gave, how that God would approve his uh, servants. The Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. One day we will hear God say, Well done, thou good and faithful. If we live for him, we are faithful to him. So, what is the affirmation of our doing right? God's word. God's word now, and God's words in the future. What about you? Um, have you experienced circumcision of the heart? Or do you just go with your outward and what people can see? Okay. And then have you experienced God's praise? Does God's word approve of you? Are you kind? And so when you read God's word, it says, be kind one another. Oh, yeah, the Bible says it, and I'm doing it. That's an affirmation of God's approval of me, because his word says so. And then one day, God will approve of you. And that should be the motivation for our living. Not the praise of men. Many, many people, even people who claim to be godly, they do what they do, and their motivation is the approval of men. They want people to think well of them. Want people to look at them and say, oh, look at that great Bible teacher or 
Look at that great God, man. You know, and that's why they're doing it. Not they're not doing it so the Lord will approve. They're doing it so that people will approve. And how about you? Are you experiencing God's affirmation? Because you can read His Word and you're doing what His Word says, and so His Word affirms you. And one of these days, God will affirm you. And is that the goal of your life? To be approved of by God, to be praised of by God. God's saying, well done, now good and faithful servant. If that's not your goal of your life, you can make that the goal of your life today. You say, it doesn't matter what man says, it doesn't matter if I'm rich and poor, it doesn't, that doesn't, nothing matters. The only thing that matters in life is, is, am I doing what God wants me to do? Will God approve of it? And how do I know what God, if I'm doing what God wants me to do? Am I obeying his word? And then how do I know that God approves of me? Because one day God will say that. So, that's my goal, to live according to his word so that one day he will say, well done, now good and faithful servant. Let's close in word of prayer. Father, we do thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for your mercy and your grace in saving us. We thank you for your continued work in our life to sanctify us. We pray you'll help us to have the goal of our life to please you, not men. We pray that you'll work in our hearts to such an end. In Jesus' name we pray.